I'm really very happy to welcome all of you who are part of our Catholic school ministry here within the diocese and recognize what an important role it is that you play in the lives and in the formation of the young people here in our diocese. Our Catholic schools are very much part of the evangelization mission of the church. We are there to spread the good news of the gospel, to renew the hearts and the minds of all who have heard it, and to share it in a special way with the young people that we serve in our classrooms. So it's a spe very special role that you have to play in carrying out this. That's not to say that there are not other aspects of the evangelization mission of the church. There's a whole effort that we must always be aware of, of our dealing with adults so that our adult formation is not lost. As we know, we have any number of children in our school programs, but we also have even greater numbers in our religious education programs throughout the diocese. And so it's important that we see what we do in our schools as part of that broader ministry an extraordinarily important part of the ministry, but basically it is one part of the ministry. In reflecting on the readings today, uh, it seems to me that there are some things in these readings that are worth our personal reflection as we reflect on the ministry within uh, our Catholic schools and the ministry that we carry out in the name of the church. And it seems to me that one of the things that is important is that we hear the words of the gospel and that we recognize that we have been called friends of the Lord because we have done everything we have heard from the Father. In our society, it seems to me that the word friends are used very loosely. Uh, and we make a distinction, if you will, between our friends and our acquaintances. We have many acquaintances, but we only have very few friends, people with whom we share our spirit and our soul and pour out our needs and our hearts. I remember one time saying to some people that I, I knew in the parish I was at, I said, you know, I only have two or three friends. And their response was, knowing you, that's not a surprise at all. <laughs> but I think it's important that when we speak about friendship, we're talking about that special relationship, a relationship with the Lord who loves us and who cares for us, who in a sense has come to us and given us a very special role. Because it's important to recognize that next line from St. John's Gospel. It was not you who chose me but I chose you and I appointed you to go and to bear fruit that will remain. And it seems to me that that's really the mission that you have as, as teachers and administrators in our school system here, that you have been called to go out and to do what the Lord has commanded you and to love one another as he also commands us as well. So it's important for us to recognize that we have been chosen to be the friends of the Lord and the deep meaning that that has, and that it isn't that we have chosen the Lord, it's rather he has chosen us, which makes it an even greater honor to know that we have been chosen out of so many to do this very important work in his name. In the reading that we had from St. Paul to the Colossians, St. Paul writes, put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. St. Paul recognized that we are the beloved and the chosen of the Lord, and that we are holy because God has made us holy. St. Paul often in his writings would refer to his letters to the saints of God, and it's important for us to recognize that as well. But as we go about that work of being the friends of the Lord, and as we recognize that we are God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, it becomes important for us to know what, what it does the, that friendship mean 
And what does that uh, notion of uh, being God's chosen one really mean as well? It seems to me that the letter from the Colossians, again, provides us with some insight into what we are to be about. And I think it translates very wonderfully into the mission that you have as Catholic educators here in the diocese. It says, put on heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another and forgiving one another. And you and I certainly know that within our society today that has become increasingly violent and increasingly disrespectful of other people, how much we need to bear with one another and to forgive one another. And that's a message that we need to uh, confer and we need to spread uh, to so many uh, other people and especially the young people in our schools. A couple of weeks ago, I was with a group of uh, the bishops from Michigan and Ohio. And after dinner, we were just having kind of a sit around conversation. And we were talking about some of the letters that we get. And I remember one of the bishops saying, and, and you know, sometimes you get those letters and you can dismiss them and other times they really irritate you. But he was talking about a letter that he had gotten and I forget what it was that he had done. It was certainly something quite worthy. And he said, it, the letter said, it appears that when you're appointed bishop, you're given stupid pills to do the Lord's work. And he obviously did not care for the work that that particular bishop had done. But I think we, we have that kind of you know, violence in our society. And if you read the letters to the editor in, in newspapers and the blogs online, and you see how hurtful and how destructive people can be. So when St. Paul teaches us you know, to be beloved, to show heartfelt compassion, to bear with one another and forgive one another. I think it's a very important message, not only for ourselves, but those with whom we communicate and share the mission that you have uh, as teachers and as administrators in school. Over and above that, we are also reminded to put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of Christ control your hearts. And that can be a real challenge at times as we live in an increasingly secular society to put on the very heart of God as we go about doing his work. We are also reminded as the chosen ones and as the friends uh, to uh, let the word of Christ dwell, in our, dwell richly within us. And as in all wisdom, you teach and admonish one another singing psalms. But in whatever you do, give thanks to God and be a thankful people. And I think that these things are so important to us. And as we gather and we reflect on this notion, if you will, of being the chosen ones of God, that God has chosen us, we are thankful being called the friends of the Lord. And now I'd like to just offer a couple of brief reflections on our own uh, situation here as we uh, you know, begin this new school year. I begin this school year with a lot of hope and a lot of trust and a lot of conviction about the future. And you know, if we're not very positive about things and if we don't have a vision and a direction, then we're never going to be very successful at what we do. And I think there have been some significant efforts that have been made uh, to try to create a a vision for Catholic education here in the diocese, and I know that many of you have been part of that. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that in your teaching in the schools of our diocese, you teach not in your own name, but you teach in the name of the church, the name of the church who uh, brings the good news to God's people. I think we need to look as we reflect on this new year of finding new and creative ways of thinking and of doing things as well. Uh, we certainly have made some efforts with the effort that's being made in Wright and Coopersville and uh, Ravenna uh, to uh, find a new way to operate very small schools. And perhaps there are ways, as we see 
you know, the technology changing and which is obviously going to affect every one of you in so many different ways over the years. It was interesting, uh, just yesterday I was with a group of priests from the diocese and one of the priests was telling me that, uh, that, that when he was going to school, in grade school, uh, he went to a two-room school. And I was really quite surprised because he had turned out quite well. And, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have thought that. I mean, uh, but I think we need to recognize that there are different ways of doing things and there need perhaps to be some different models. And it's encouraging to me that we are looking at some of those models and trying to implement the, the efforts at All Saints, the efforts at Muskegon Catholic, uh, to operate in somewhat uh, different ways, I think are helpful to us all. But I'm also encouraged too, because this year we seem to be uh, attaining a much better retention rate. There are 12 schools in the diocese that have either uh, met their uh, last year's enrollment or in a number of instances have surpassed that in some significant ways. And so there are these signs of hope that I see, and I would hope that you would see them there as well and be part of embracing this vision of looking to the future with confidence and trust. It doesn't mean, though, that there are not going to be problems. And when I mention to you that uh, we teach in the name of the church, it's a source of some consolation and comfort to me to know that over half of the teachers in the diocese that are teaching in our Catholic schools are certified to teach religious education as well. We'd like to see that number jump from 50% to 100% uh, within a reasonable amount of time. Because I think it's so important as you're prepared to, uh, to teach the subjects that you teach, this faith that is ours and that you pass on to others and share with others is very much at the core of who you are. And so it's important not simply to rely on what you may have learned in grade school or high school or college. So that certification becomes very important. And I'm very grateful to Sister Barbara who has been uh, working on that now for the past several years. And I'm grateful for your uh, commitment to working within it as well. We have a number of our schools where every teacher is certified as a catechist as well. And I think that's very significant. I think it's also important, and one of the reasons for us to be filled with signs of hope, is that we're looking to some new models of governance within the diocese that hopefully will be helpful to our parishes and to our schools. And as I was reflecting on the models of governance, I mean, some of us, when you get, after you get to be 70, you've lived with a lot of history. And uh, I remember, you know, as a youngster growing up and even in my early years of, uh, the high, of uh, uh, grade school, that it was the pastor and the school principal who ran the school. And nobody else had anything to say about it. And uh, what they decided went. And then we moved into a model where we began to have some school boards. And sometimes those school boards were modeled on the public school boards. And ultimately, they led to a certain frustration as well. And so I think it's important for us to reflect on that notion. But so often, our school boards are made up only of parents who have children in the school. And as a result of that, among the major concerns that they have are to keep the tuition low, keep the class sizes low, but don't very often have a vision that moves us beyond that. And so I think what we're looking to do is to expand the model of governance to provide for a broader range of people providing responsibility or taking responsibility for our schools. You know, we have in, in so many ways, there are different aspects of our school life. There are different aspects of people in, in our parishes. We have the parent group that needs to be part of the life of the school. There should be people on the school boards who are part of the general parish community who have no particular connection at all, but who can bring an objectivity and a seriousness to the discussion that's there. And in addition to that, there probably need to be members of the broader community 
because our own schools make a very significant contribution to the life of our society, and we need to be able to interact with them in a very positive way. And so I think it's important for us to do that. It's also important for us to clarify, if you will, the roles that each person has in this entire process, which is also part of our governance model. That it's important to know what is the role of the board? What authority and what responsibility does it have? We know historically, in some instances, it's meant they have none. In other instances, they've tried to manage who was going to sweep the floor in the classrooms. And we have this wide range. And so there's the effort to clarify. And what has been discovered across the country is that as you begin to use these models, you begin to discover a success that you never could have imagined before. So I would just like to suggest to you today that as I look forward with hope and confidence and trust in the future, that you can do the same, that you can move forward with an excitement and a sense of uh, vision for, for the church and the young people that you serve, and that you can do it in a spirit of joy and that you'll know God's special blessings because of it. St. Paul reminds us, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And as we gather on an occasion like this, I'm reminded of some words of Isaac Hecker. As we look to the future, as we look to strengthen the present moment, our goal, as he stated it, was to create a future that is greater than any past.